So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the internal communications webinar presented by the guest services community. I'm Elizabeth Dickey. I work with the Idaho Botanical Garden. And a year ago, the guest services community sent out a survey um, to asking the members to pick their top five guest services topics um, that they're interested in been learning more about from a list of about 12 options. And the number one choice uh, was guest services training best practices, which we discussed in a webinar offered last October, and that's recorded and available to you to watch. And the second topic of most interest was internal communication issues, and that's the reason why we are meeting here today. Um, through the guest services discussion board, I requested members share with me their communication problems and the solutions they used. I gathered their responses and organized them. During this fact-finding mission, Linda Gusky with the Green Bay Botanic Garden offered to share the process her garden was currently developing. She'll speak about that process at the end of this webinar. Krista Daherty with the Morgan Morton Arboretum donated her knowledge of technical technological communication solutions, and Chris Martinez of Descanso Gardens and, and Tyler Pazuto with Patterns helped create this webinar as well. Um, during this talk, I will mention some names of some computer programs or apps that you might want to use. And just to let you know, this is just to give you some examples. So I'm not familiar with all the different um, forms of technology that can be used, and I'm not re recommending anyone in particular, but if you're looking for a technological solution, I suggest you do some research, see what's available, and then use the APGA discussion boards to get an idea what, for what works well at other gardens. And so keep in mind that what might work at one garden may not be the best fit for yours. So one of the many, um, one of the most common complaints in my work is that a person did not know something that they thought that others should have told them about. It was heartening as well as disturbing that this issue was widespread. So it wasn't just our garden the saying that people didn't communicate well. So the next few slides will list some areas that need to be considered. Guest services staff interact with most most people that visit a garden. They might be part-time staff who do not regularly interact with other departments. Therefore, they may not be aware of or remember information other staff members live and breathe. They are asked many questions by guests and need to know the answers or how to readily find the information. Uh, here's some of the information they may need but may not think they have available to them. Departments need to know what each other's doing, if particularly when it affects their activities. People need to know where to find the things they need when they need them and how to get more if something is running out. They like to know that their requests have been seen and have an idea of when they we will be fulfilled. And everyone likes to know what is happening. Before problems can be fixed, you need to know what the problems are. You find out by asking your staff. You can do it by holding in-person meetings, you can send out a survey, or you can observe people in action to determine where the problems lie. Once you've identified your problem areas, you look into possible solutions. Many of those solutions involve technology. For it to work effectively, everyone needs to be trained on how to use it and then actually adopt and use that system. Here are some general options for technology solutions. Each one has certain things it would be good at and things that it might not be good at. In each case, technology is only part of the solution. People and process are also really important considerations. You should also remember that communication doesn't have to happen on only one platform. And some effective platforms, like all staff meetings or physical bulletin boards, don't involve technology at all. Research shows that hitting people with multiple messages through different media, say visual versus oral versus text-based, is most effective for communicating messages that stick. Here are two examples of platforms you might already have in place and what they might help solve and what you want to consider as drawbacks. So there's email. So it's good for targeting one-way communication. And then some problem is it's not all people would be, uh, be able to access their email at all times. And then intranet. An intranet is a private network that can be accessed only by authorized users. An example is Microsoft SharePoint. 
An intranet can include calendars, project timelines, task lists, and messaging. You can get free instant messaging apps such as Skype or Slack, or it can be a part of other project management software such as Asana. Scheduling software helps plan who works when and can make things run more efficiently. Here at the Idaho Botanical Garden, we use Vlogistics to schedule volunteers and upkeep for scheduling uh, maintenance requests. Project management programs are useful for outlining what will be needed for a project, how much it will cost, who will be involved, who will be doing what by when, and can track the progress. It can be a big help when planning a project, but after that, it is only useful if the plan is referred to regularly and is kept up to date. If people do look at it regularly, they will know how things are progressing, what to expect to happen next, where something will take place, and who else will be affected. Project management programs can be very simple. Um, this is a case we use at, um, at my work is just a single page. It has all the information right there. Or project management programs can be exceedingly complicated. Um, for this one here, it um, it's runs sort of like an Excel sheet. You can see across the bottom, there's different tabs. Um, the project charter would talk about things like why we have, we're doing this project, what its purpose is. Stakeholders would be all the people involved, the people who'd be interested in the project, the people who are going to be doing the project and who it's going to affect. Um, the scope is the page that's up, so it has, um, you know, what it's about and the description and what's going to happen. Um, and then you have the communication plan, so all the people that are going to be involved in the project, how are they going to be talking to each other? And then you have this team operating agreement, the all, each person agrees to do whatever it is that they've been assigned to do, and it just goes on from there. So this one um, has a whole lot of parts and things to keep track of. Um, there is an online version um, of project management called Asana that the Botanical Garden is just now um, starting to use, and so that uh, would be an option. So also to communicate, you can have shared calendars. So calendars are a good a way to post a lot of information that can be seen at a glance. And we'll talk about some. So customer relations management software often have a built-in calendar, but it would be aware that not all staff may be able to access it. So we use, um, a pro program here, All True, um, but only certain staff can get into All True to see that particular calendar. Any with an, anyone with an email address that can get access to the internet can access these calendars here. So the Google and uh, Outlook calendars are more readily available to folks. Master calendars allow access for input from many users. Personal calendars have only one author, but they can be shared with others. This is helpful for planning meetings, as you can see what others might, might have time to meet. Weekly calendars can be created and then sent to all staff. Information from multiple calendars can, can be bind, excuse me, can be combined and sent out in a single document. They can also be printed and posted in helpful locations. The Idaho Botanical Garden uses Excel to create its weekly update. And here's an example of one. So in this update, um, so we take information from all different calendars, the all true calendar that not everybody can see, um, our shared master calendar that everybody can access and combine it all together. So and then we um, put it into Excel and send it out and people can um, access it online or through their phones or it can be printed and posted. So you can say stuff like who's in charge each day for jobs that rotate daily. So who's going to be in the admissions kiosk, who's working in the store, uh, which are the horticulturalists on duty. 
You can also um, list the happenings each day, what field trips are coming, what meetings are scheduled, are there going to be any private events, public events, are there areas closed due to construction, or closed to, uh, is the whole garden closed due to an event. And then also there's, um, in this case, we have a listing of upcoming events, things that are going to happen in future week, weeks that people might want to keep in mind. And then also we can post um, special store hours or garden hours on this document. So short-term calendars cover just one particular day. And a production schedule tells the staff, everybody, what's going to be going on during a particular event that might um, be taking up you know, a lot of the garden space or most of the day. And this is an example of a production schedule. So we have an event called Bug Day, and we take the Friday the, um, to just set up. So there's just some listing of things that need to be done that day. And then you see on Saturday, it's much more detailed. Um, it's what's going to be happening at any one particular time. It's helpful for the event staff to check things off, and also everybody else can know um, what to expect to be going on when. Email is a good way to share information, particularly if staff can receive it and checks it at least a couple of times a day. So uh, we might have some people who work out in the garden. They um, don't sit at a desk, they're not at a computer, but we try to make time to make sure that they have time um, to go to a station and take a look at their email. Sometimes you need to get a piece of information to somebody right away. Here are three ways to do that. So you can call them on the phone, or if uh, depending on your, your facility, you may or may not be able to call them on their personal phone or send them a text. Uh, radios or walkie-talkies can be extremely um, beneficial. You can get a hold of people right away, communicate quickly that way. And if you can't get them by phone, you can't get them by the radio, then um, you can get up and hunt them down to let them know what the message happens to be. So addressing communication problems often means making changes to the way people work, and change can be hard, even if the results are intended to be positive. Here are some things to consider as you move forward. Part of the solution is to help staff think about what information others will need or want to know. Anyone who interacts with the public in any way, in person, via phone, through email, website, or social media, needs to be familiar with their organization, what it does, and how it operates. This slide and the next have, has examples of information almost all staff members who have contact with the public should be familiar with or know where to find. Here's some more. Of course, you have others that are particular to your facility. So lots of information can be delivered through meetings. Senior staff could meet once a month. All staff meetings can be difficult to hold in large organizations, but it's good for everyone to get together and have a chance to interact with the other departments because they may not be able to see them regularly. So you get to know everybody else and get an idea of what they do and it helps people work together more smoothly. Meetings may seem to interfere with work being done, but open communication and personal interaction is crucial for an organization to work well. Daily updates can be read at daily departmental check-ins. They can be posted or they can be emailed. Even after you have determined your organization's problem areas, researched the solutions and implemented them, desired results will take time to reach. 
After a culture of communication has been firmly established, new staff will need to be brought into the fold. Updates to information will need to be maintained and communication training should take place periodically to help staff remember all that they need to know. Green Bay Botanical Garden is now working to improve their garden's communication system. Linda Gusky will now share with us her experience. We just take, need to take a moment to switch over slides from one person to another. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. This is Linda Gusky again from Green Bay Botanical Garden and working on sharing my screen there. You should, everyone should have it now. So as Elizabeth had mentioned, we are currently in the process of an internal communications project at Green Bay Botanical Garden here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I am the education manager and I have been working most closely with our marketing, or excuse me, our director of marketing and communications when we started the project. So I, one caveat, as Elizabeth had said before, I will be mentioning a few of the technology pieces that we are using currently, but again, everybody has to see what fits best for their organization. This is what we're working with at this time. We're not even 100% sure yet if it's the best for organizations, but this is what we're starting with, and um, you'll see some of those as we go along. So we actually started back in August, and as I mentioned, it's collaboration between marketing and education to begin with. And we also checked in with our executive director to begin because we knew this was going to be a larger project that was going across clearly the entire garden staff. We set three overarching goals with strategies and objectives and tactics to go all with them. And we made sure to include all of our staff in the process, whether they were full-time, seasonal, part-time, um, any that were available. So as we go through this, so what really kicked off our internal communications project was our director of marketing actually watched a webinar from the nonprofit marketing guide. Kelly LaRue Miller is the owner and facilitator for that program. It's a web-based program that our director of marketing actually subscribes to through the year. And so it was a two-part webinar all about internal communications. And using Kivi and her tactics as a guide, she really promoted thinking strategically, which I think we all get, but it's easy to just jump in and try something without putting that plan in place first. So we were trying to be very thoughtful and purposeful about thinking strategically and creating our goals and then our strategies, objectives, and tactics to meet those goals before we just jumped in and tried introducing new tactics, so new tools to the rest of our garden staff. According to Kivi, the goals for, in, for internal communication should fall into three strategies, or excuse me, three categories. The first category of strategic leadership, some of the goal examples that she had were unifying people around shared goals or implementing changes within the organization. Under organizational culture, she had a couple options of motivating staff to act, building brand ambassadors, and then under project management, a few of her suggestions were improving project coordination and fostering accountability. And now I do have the names of her blogs. Those are free blogs that you can access without having the subscription to her website. So if you wanna check those out for some expanded information, feel free to do that. We chose to pick one goal within each, let me back up, each of those three different categories. So one from the strategic leadership, one from the organizational culture, and one from project management. And I'll show those um, in order here. So from our strategic leadership, the goal that we chose was providing big picture content. And we chose this goal, the, and this was actually before we talked to our staff, our marketing director of marketing, me and our executive director, we picked these goals because of some feedback we had already gotten from a staff survey the previous year when they had told us, you know, we we really don't know all that's going on and we'd like to know more. So really providing that big picture content with the strategies of improving, improving our information flow through the organization and breaking down those org silos. And then you can see our objectives that go along with those strategies along the way. Our second, which falls under the organizational culture, is building trust and relationships. So we did feel, again, when, when people shared with us in our previous staff survey that they wanted to know more about what was going on. Part of it felt like they 
needed to continue to build those relationships. This really directly relates to that last goal of breaking down those org silos. And so part of those strategies are adding better channels. So when I say channels, I just mean different channels of communication and then everyone using them with this in the second strategy of holding better and or different meetings. Because I think we've all felt that we know the feeling of being in a meeting where we're not quite sure if we should be there or somebody is really dragging on. So just really being purposeful with the meetings that we're having. And lastly, our goal under the project management was streamlining those workflows. So redefining the etiquette for the channels of communication that we already have, improving project management. I, Elizabeth had showed you some tools that they use and later on I'll show you a couple snippets from a program that we're using and then thoughtful targeting. So making sure that when we're working on a project that crosses the lines of the different departments that we're including the right people at the right time. All of these goals, strategies, and objectives that we chose, this language is directly from those webinars that we watched from the non Ron, excuse me, nonprofit marketing guide as well. There is a cost for that webinar. It's not something that you have to watch, but it did help us guide us in our process. So after we picked all of those goals, we set forth our action plan. So we were starting with a presentation to our staff because we really wanted to make sure that we had some buy-in from them at the beginning. We didn't want them to feel like we were just going to throw a bunch of new technology at them or processes at them that they didn't have a say in. So we presented to the staff and really focused in on some of the issues that we were hearing. People are getting too many emails people are having too many meetings. They're not sure what's going on. After that, we did break each department up and did a 30 minute focus group with them. However, when we did these focus groups, we did not include the department head. We wanted to make sure that the members of the department felt that they, felt that they could talk openly and freely with us to share some of the concerns that they were having with communication. We also did a survey for some of our part-time staff that weren't available for the focus groups. We have some bartenders that are very, very part-time and also some seasonal staff that uh, were already gone for the season. So we were able to reach out and get some of their feedback as well. And I will say I was impressed. We were able to stay to about 30 minutes for those focus groups. We really wanted to make sure that as facilitators, we were just listening and not offering suggestions and giving everybody in that department just an opportunity to express the concerns, what was working well, what wasn't working well. The next part of our action plan upon completing those focus groups and the surveys, of course, compiling all of that feedback and identifying areas of need that fit within those goals and strategies that we were working towards. And at that point, when we felt like we had all the information, it was time to add additional staff to our task force because just the marketing and education teams aren't the only ones, of course, that are communicating with other people. So we were able to bring in somebody from our guest services staff, another person from our sales team, and then our volunteer coordinator as well. And then the task force worked together to start identifying and evaluating effective tools, so ways that we could reach those goals mentioned earlier. We also were tasked to develop a communications charter for all of the tools including what are the expectations of use and the etiquette around these. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then lastly, developing a plan for implementation and training of any of the new things we were going to be introducing. So before I go into the new things, I do just want to mention what we already had in place for communication. So I think many gardens use Altru or something similar. That's our point of sale. So everybody, it's a cloud-based system and um, just about everybody in our staff has access to it. That's where all of the transactions with guest services happen, our memberships, that's our membership database, our volunteer database. We have all of our programs run through that system. So we do have Altru already. Um, we use Outlook for email. We had tried using a um, organization-wide calendar for saying when people are out of office, that is hit or miss. <laughs> Next, 
Caterees is the program that we use for event management software, so actually booking the rooms within our organization as we do have a number of different rooms that are available for meetings and classes and such. Volunteer Hub is a, another cloud-based system that we use, and that's actually for where our volunteers are signing up. So I know it says we use Altru for volunteer database. They actually integrate with each other, Volunteer Hub and Altru. So that's relatively new. We haven't even had it for a year yet, um, but that allows us to have volunteers sign up for their shifts. Then of course we use walkie talkies to communicate people with people that aren't at their desks right away. And we do have monthly staff meetings with as many staff can be there and weekly management meetings. So the um, heads of a number of the departments are able to come together weekly to check in. All right, so far, the first things we did here, our kind of low hanging fruit uh, was, as I mentioned, we have monthly staff meetings and weekly department head meetings, but not everybody can be in on those meetings, of course. And we had never had a system for sending out minutes from those. And for our monthly staff meeting, most people are able to be there. So those minutes weren't necessarily quite as needed, but especially our weekly department head meetings, there were things that came up in there that may affect guest services, may affect our horticulture staff, and they weren't there to hear that. So we started sending out minutes from our monthly all staff meetings, and then weekly we would keep it to five bullets or less of the most important things that everybody would need to know, and that would also be distributed to the staff. And I'll tell you about how that's happening a little bit later with another one of our tools. Next, we introduced a quarterly budget update at every staff or at staff meetings, so every four staff meetings. We were feeling that, you know, in your department, again, you know how your budget's looking, but you don't necessarily know how that affects the bottom line of the entire organization, especially when maybe one of your budget items is falling short and you're not quite sure how that's doing. So our executive director actually just happenstance decided to do it at a meeting and everybody really liked it and so we decided to keep that quarterly to just make sure everybody knows the status of where the garden's at and if your budget doesn't look so good doesn't necessarily mean others do or your budget might look great and is really helping to bring everybody up then lastly again to break down those org silos and give that big picture we have implemented triannual, which goes along with the way we do our newsletter and kind of schedule programs here at Green Bay Botanical Garden. Triannual check-ins with our leadership meetings just to make sure that all of this, the leaders know the big, big events that are coming up. For instance, with education, our school visits go through the middle of October. So I want to remind our horticulture staff at our August meeting that, hey, we still have tours coming in, so don't cut all of the flowers back or don't cut all the herbs back. So just reminding them of things that might happen yearly but don't directly affect them and that they want to keep in mind. The next area that we are implementing, so here I'm going to go into some of the tools. These are larger processes, so not quite as easy to implement as that last slide. We decided on an instant messaging tool called Slack, and some of the expectations that we put on this are, were that it would be used by all staff when they're at work, so they don't, we're not expecting them to use it when they're not at work, especially for those part-time staff. And then um, we were able to use this, actually, they have a free standard plan for nonprofits for up to 250 users. So Slack instant messaging tool, here's a screenshot. Think of just like sending a text message, but this will be used for those quicker requests or um, this is, we're actually gonna use it to replace our all users emails. So rather than sending an email to everybody and filling up an inbox, um, we can do that on Slack. Slack allows you to break things up by channel. That's what they call them. So separate discussions for each thing, which is what we really like about Slack right now, because especially when you get into a long email chain, if you decide five emails in that, oh my gosh, we forgot to include Elizabeth on there, let's pull her in. Well, now Elizabeth has to go and sort through all these emails. And I think we've all been in that situation where somebody responds to one, but doesn't respond to another. And it gets to be complicated. And in Slack, everybody can see the full conversation right away. In my slide here, you'll notice um, we have we had some 
sewer smell, we've got some issues. <laughs> so we're actually using Slack as our maintenance channel as well, so that we can, we can message to our facilities. And when I go in and say, oh, I forgot that light bulb's out, I need to remember to tell Dave, I can go in and see, oh, nope, somebody already sent it to him, rather than sending, again, duplicate emails to let them know if there's a maintenance issue. So those are a couple of the ways that we're using Slack. Another great thing about Slack or an instant message tool in general, I'd say many of in the instant messaging or there was a different name, social enterprise um, platforms that we mentioned earlier, many of them have these same features. Oops. And we really liked that you could set your status and you could look real quick next to a person's name. You'll Here you'll see me. There's a little radio by me, which means, oh, I am out on the walkie talkies. I'm not at my desk. So another great thing for Slack is you can set your status and people can see at a glance if you're in the office, out of the office. We're even thinking right now, uh, we haven't implemented it yet, but thinking about having an out of the office channel where if people are going to be gone for you know, more than just the afternoon or if they're going to be on vacation for a week where we can put that in there. We're still figuring out how that works um, since our shared calendar with everybody wasn't being utilized as effectively. But this is another great way to just take a quick glance, quick glance and see who is available. So Slack so far, we, the way we implemented it with our staff is we actually did it in a webinar format. So just like you're sitting on this webinar, my coworker in marketing and I put together our whole training plan and then they were able to sit at their desk, play in Slack while we were teaching them about Slack. And then we also created this outline for them of when to use Slack versus email versus scheduling a meeting. One reminder when you're entering or introducing a new tool to your folks, make it as easy as possible for them. It might add more work to you if you're the one that's creating the program, which it definitely was a lot of work, but the more you can guide them along and give them the tools to be successful up front, the more apt they are to want to utilize the tools. So we put together this little flow chart, which we had based off of a different one that we found online. So you can see it, you know, can it be answered quickly or simply? Go to Slack. No, maybe it needs to be a meeting or an email. So things that they can, they can go to this and really kind of figure out the best way. And hopefully this will become just natural as they go along and use it more. With this document, we also wanted to give people the ability to hold others accountable. So if Elizabeth sent me a Slack message and I think, oh, you know what, this is really long and complex, that probably should have been email, I can Slack her back and say, hey, let's move this over to email or let's take this, can I just pop in and talk to you for 15 minutes? Um, Again, we wanted to give our staff the ability to hold each other accountable and to give each other grace and patience through this process, knowing that everybody's learning together. I'm gonna check, I see some chats. I'm just gonna check real quick in case there's anything that directly, oh, it's not popping up for me. Anyways, so Slack was our instant messaging tool that we have implemented. We implemented this mid-January, so we're about a month in with all of the staff being on it, and so far it's going well. The next tool that we're implementing is Asana. Elizabeth had mentioned this earlier. Asana is a project management tool, uh, and this one, it's another free platform. There, of course, are always options to upgrade by um, paying a small fee. So a great thing about Asana is, as you can see in my screenshot here, you can separate it by teams. And if you, like right now, only our marketing and communications team actually uses the paid version because they've found that they need a more robust system. So far in education, we haven't need the paid system. And so it's really nice that you can select what you're paying for by department. So with that project management tool, this right now isn't something that we're rolling out among all the staff. We're doing it kind of department by department. And it, it's really awesome because you can assign tasks directly to people. You can put a due date on them. They'll get emails about what's coming up for them. And you can really see your whole project management or your whole project at a glance. Then the following year, 
or excuse me, when you're, if it's a program that you do every year, you can just reschedule once it's done to the next year. So you don't have to recreate it every year. It helps to cut back on all kinds of Excel documents and having multiple documents in multiple places because you can upload anything into Asana as well. Another great thing about Asana is that it integrates with Slack. So Slack and Asana work well. If you're in Slack and somebody requests something of you, you can make it a task right into Asana. Then our next area, a tool that we're looking to implement but we're still researching is scheduling software for staff. Right now, each department does their scheduling a little differently. Some it's a paper calendar, some it's an Excel document, um, but none of it is really live and people can just go in and change things around when they need to. So we are still researching what will work best um, across departments. Right now, our top option for a free software excuse me, is Open Simpson. We also looked at Homebase and When I Work, and um, I think I mentioned this before, but this is just for staff, so we already use Volunteer Hub for our volunteers. The last thing we're, or not last thing, the next thing we're doing as we implement this project is we're creating white pa papers for all of these tools so we can really outline the purpose, the staff expectations, basics on how to use. So we can't tell everybody exactly how to use it, but if we can at least give them some tips to get that started and see how it will best work for them. And then lastly, that etiquette for use. What are different ways that you can use this tool and what are, what are ways you don't? Um, and this has been really helpful. Again, giving your folks as much information to begin with to help that transition is really helpful, especially when you have varying levels of comfortability with technology if you're implementing new technology. And then overall, we are also putting together a communications charter to just outline briefly with a full bullet, few bullet points, the etiquette and expectations for the tools that we're using. So I mentioned Slack already and, of, and etiquette for emails and meetings now that we have Slack and Asana, work phones, personal phones, and walkie talkies, as you can see there. Other tactics that we're thinking about, but we haven't quite finalized yet how we're going to do it, is if we want to do some type of department dashboard. So outside of those Monday, or excuse me, those um, weekly meeting with the managers, other dashboards that say, okay, this is what education's working on, this is what events working on. Um, we think we might be able to do that in Slack, but we're not sure yet. Still figuring out the best platform for that, as we don't really have an intranet right now. We do have a shared folder drive, but that's not quite the same. Then defining how information flows between departments. So especially for our guest services staff, of course, they, they're the ones that need to know everything going on, right? We've already seen the different things that they are, need to be in the know because of questions they get. But what's the best way for them to gather information? Like I might think in education, I'm going to put this all in a Word document and then print it off for them and put it in a binder. But then the guest services staff may say, uh, that doesn't really work for us. And I don't think we've really taken that step to ask them how best works for them. So that defining how information flows de between departments really addresses how we get information to our guest services staff, but also other departments as well. And then last year, lastly, if we have an easy tool to identify who to direct guests to when we get questions and requests for our guest services staff. Right now we have a big long Word document, but we've had people changing over and some duties changing. So really figuring out if we can do that in a more effective way. So our key takeaways, of course, as I mentioned, we've been doing this since August. We're still in the process of it. Just because we decided to go Big and huge doesn't mean you need to, but some of our key takeaways that we've realized through this process is just to make sure that you have support from your leadership team and your executive director. So when we were doing our focus groups, we even did a focus group with the leadership team alone to talk to all of them. And we also, when we trained everybody in Slack, we actually trained the leadership team first, separate from everybody else. So again, they had a preview before all their staff were diving into it, and hopefully we could get some buy-in from them and they could be cheerleaders for us as we were introducing that new technology. 
I mentioned this before, but it's always good to reiterate, to make sure to give yourself and others some time, patience, and grace. I know that our director of development, right away when we introduced Black, she said, but what if I get it wrong? And we, of course, said, well, that's okay. That's a learning experience. We'll tell you, hey, Cindy, that would be great as a phone call. Why don't you call me next time about that? And it's a learning process along the way. So again, just reminding the staff that it's okay. We know you're not going to get it all right away. And it's a learning process, so we might try. Like I said, we're using Slack right now. We might find that maybe Microsoft Teams would have been a better option because it integrates with Outlook, and that's what we're already using for email. Next, make sure to involve other staff in the process. Again, when you involve them, you are taking their feedback, and they feel ownership of the project as well, and giving guidance and support. Then we also found that when we were doing a focus group, there were some issues that came up that were bigger than internal communication, more culture-wide or spanning departments that was beyond just the way we communicate with each other. It did kind of uh, fall back to that trust and relationships because we've grown pretty fast and we've had a lot of new team members. So we had to go back to the drawing board with our leadership team and executive director to take a look at some other options for staff development and team building workshops. So that is what Green Bay Botanical Garden is doing. Uh, here's my contact information if you have any other specific questions. And I'm gonna see if I can pop into the chat as well to see if there's anything there that I can help with. But otherwise, yeah. Yeah, there were, yeah, some, I can... uh, were some questions there. Um... Perfect. For some reason, it's not. Yeah, maybe if I, I... Can... oh, here we go. Yeah, I can read them. Okay. I yeah. can read I, them. I you found them. Help. So I think okay. I'm okay. Um... Oh, Sling as an online scheduling system. I'll take a look at that. Sling as well. How do we set up staff training using Slack? Yes, so as I kind of mentioned, the staff training for Slack, we actually, so we got a free 14-day trial to WebEx, I believe. No, excuse me, go to meetings. <laughs> so we actually did it just like we're doing now where we had each person a couple days before the webinar, we sent them instructions on how to use or excuse me, how to download Slack onto their desktop so that they had it and were all ready to go for the webinar. And then we sent them the webinar request um, that morning to make sure that they had time to, or that it didn't get lost in their email somewhere. Um, and our director of communications and I, we put together a slide deck of all the information we wanted to share. So screenshots of Slack with a lot of text on there. But when we were actually doing the webinar, uh, we just shared our screen and we were in Slack going through all the different areas of it and showing people how they could use Slack, how they could send messages. Um, in Slack, there's direct messages, which is kind of like a phone call where you're just calling or you're messaging to one specific person. Or I had shown, I can back up a little bit into that. I had shown those channels where you are sending messages on specific topics with a larger group. Um, the great thing about Slack is people can join channels, join conversations and pop out of them as they like. So if they decide that something doesn't really apply to them, they can pop out of it. Or if they realize, hey, we've got this event coming up and I haven't heard anything lately. Let me see if there's a conversation going on about it somewhere else then they can pop into that as well. I'm gonna get back to my question sheet here. Hopefully that answers the question about how we trained with Slack. There we go. Oops. And then let's see. I may have given a incorrect answer um, about um, Slack. I was probably thinking about Asana. So the question had been, do do um, all staff, can they see all the different channels in Slack and or do they need to be invited um, to a particular channel? Great question. So in Slack, there's the option to make channels public or private. And actually on my screen there, you'll see there's a little hashtag in front of some of these channels. Any that have hashtags 
are open and can be searched by anyone. Anybody can join them or leave them. Um, however, if you make a channel private, which you do in the creation of your channel, which don't need to go that deep into that, um, that's when you can choose for it to be private and then whomever created the channel or who's part of the channel, they have to invite others to it. So the Slack organization really promotes the use of public channels as much as possible to really keep open conversation among the, the staff, but it's really up to those that are creating the channels if they want it to be public or private. Let's see. And to see a message you do in a channel, you do have to be part of the channel. So if you haven't joined it, um, you won't see them until you do. But once you do join a channel, you'll be able to see all of the conversation that has already been had. Okay, what do I mean by white paper? That was some terminology I didn't really understand when I first started with this either. Um, basically, it's just kind of a how-to sheet or a, a directionals on how to use the different tools. So I had given in my presentation here some of the things that we included. So it's just a Word document saying, giving people this outline of the purpose and their expectations and everything. Oh, I keep switching back and forth on you, sorry. Yeah, there was a question, does Slack go to cell phones, computers, or both? It can go to both. Yep, Slack is an app that you can download onto your cell phone if you would like. Okay, let's see. Oh, I'm going to have to check out this sling that everybody's talking about. How do we use manage track IT requests? So we are actually right now we're doing that in Slack. We have a channel specifically, oh, excuse me, IT requests. I'll be honest, um, we don't have an IT staff here. We're trying to figure that out yet. In our Slack, we do have what we call our help channels. So I'll, I think I can see some of those. So yeah, um, so we have a help channel for our all true platform, a help channel for Slack where people can go in there and ask questions about those different platforms that we use. Um, and we have a few people that are designated to monitor those, but we that's a system we don't have clearly defined yet. All true replace Razor's Edge, yes. Oh yes, our staff, thank you for asking that. I forgot to mention that earlier. We have around 20 full-time staff and another 10 part-time staff all year. And then in the summer, we jump up to about 50 staff with all of our seasonal and interns. And to give a little bit more demographics, we see around 180,000 visitors a year, mostly because we're seasonal from May through August with another big bulk of them coming in December for our holiday light show. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else using things that they really like? Maybe drop it in the comments if you'd like. Yes, we outsource our IT needs. We have an IT company that we work directly with that comes in once a month to manage our servers and things like that. We do not use Slack with volunteers at this time. I'm not sure right now if we plan to do that or not. As I mentioned earlier, we just introduced Volunteer Hub last year and we've had some changeover in staff. So our new volunteer manager is looking to see what all the capabilities are with Volunteer Hub and there might be some capabilities within theirs to be able to do some instant messaging. So yeah, right now we don't use Slack with volunteers and I don't think we'll plan to use it with them, but that'll be a learning process as we go along. Are we pleased with Ultru? There are some things that does really great. And I say, while I say that, I'm sure other people are reacting the same way. As the education staff for setting up our classes and being able to sell it online and at the front desk and in real time, that's been really helpful for us because before we had Razor's Edge, but then we had a different way to sell 
our classes at the front desk and we'd have to make sure that we were communicating, you know, if there was only two spots left and somebody purchased it online, but then somebody purchased it at the desk. And anyways, um, so I'm really appreciating that about Altru is the way that everything integrates and is in real time can keep track of who is registering for things. Um, and I can't speak to how it works for membership as I'm not on the membership side of it. There are definitely things in Altru that take extra steps. Um, so we're working with Ultra. We weren't able, one area of Ultra, we thought we'd be able to use that for our event management system where we could really reserve all of our rooms in Ultra as well, but it didn't quite, it wasn't quite as robust as we needed for being able to reserve rooms and um, assign different resources to it. So if that room was using a um, a projector or a microphone and things like that and keep track of it um, so that didn't really quite work as well for Ultra. Um, Ultra does integrate with Volunteer Hub as I mentioned so we're trying to which is one of the reasons we went with Volunteer Hub trying to work with that to be able to make Ultra a little more user friendly for us so Ultra just takes a few extra steps sometimes um, but does I feel like does have some positives as well. And then Ken asked, how are gardens dealing with the upstairs, downstairs mentality that sometimes presents between facilities that house administrative functions versus working functions? That is something that we're effective, uh, actively working on. And that was, I would say that type of mentality is also what fit under our goal of building trust and relationships, of building that trust and the relationships to be able to have those conversations if, um, we're seeing some of that mentality going on. I'd say that's probably a bigger issue that we uh, can't quite tackle solely with internal communications, but hopefully will help to make things more transparent and help to break down some of those barriers. Another thing that we had done last year, again, separate from our internal communications, but out of that staff survey that we do kind of yearly to see how things are going, um, when we heard that people felt like they didn't know what was going on or we're wondering, well, what the heck does horticulture do in the winter time? Uh, we did go through a process of at, st at one staff meeting, a couple departments would really outline everything that they do to really just break down those um, org silos to help people understand that everybody has a lot going on. Um, but I, I'll defer to other people as to how folks are dealing with that upstairs downstairs mentality. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. We're doing some of that as well. We are, we've started some more, we call it our friends at work social gatherings. question, uh, what do you use for selling tickets online for our light show? We use Altru for that as well. And that, again, comes with some drawbacks. Uh, pr prior to Altru, we had a ticketing system. I think, I know we used CrowdTorch at one point. I'm not sure if that was online, though. Um, and prior to Altru, I started right before Altru started, so I'm not actually sure what system we used before Altru for online. I know we had Razor's Edge for not online, but unfortunately, I apologize. Anybody else have systems that they use for selling tickets online besides Altru? That's what we're using right now. So it looks like a bit of variety, Acme, RecTrack, Eventbrite, Active. D, I like your comment. Love and hate it. Yes, yes, I feel that. Outbound for online ticketing. I haven't worked specifically with that program, but just in general with technology, definitely some love and hate relationships. There was a question that just came through from Georgine. Do you use Shift4 
uh, Vantiv for credit card processing. Right now, we use actually Blackbaud Merchant Services. Blackbaud is the parent company to Altru, so that's where all of our credit card processing goes through. We had a an outside source doing it previously, uh, but we shifted to Blackbaud last April, I believe. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate your feedback and your discussion and just learning along with us. So if you have anything else to add, uh, of course, feel free. We can have more discussion in the guest services community through APGA. Otherwise, have a fantastic afternoon.